In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The Gospel today has these words, Make an account of thy stewardship, for thou canst be steward no longer. Every man's stewardship ends with his death. And then immediately, we are taught that he will have to give a strict account of all of his life to the Lord. This is called our particular judgment. That is, as soon as a person passes from this life, he will go immediately before the throne of the judge and be judged particularly by himself. And then the general judgment will occur when all of the whole world unites together somewhere in this world, and then that will be what we call the final judgment. But here we're talking about the stewardship of each individual. We have all been given powers of the body. We have been given talents and graces, all of the seven sacraments at our disposal, our God dying for us, our Blessed Mother with her special gifts, all of these things, the abuse of them and the use of them, our sins of omission, all of these at our particular judgment, God has given to us as stewards to watch over them, to use them correctly. They come from Him. And then He is going to ask each and every one of us individually what we did with those. It is almost a unanimous consent, and here we begin the part of the sermon that I almost dread to enter, because I don't know how you're going to take it, but it is almost a unanimous consent among the fathers and doctors of the Church, and the great theologians, and the saints, as well as the stories in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they agree to, that the stewardship of the majority of men are as the one in today's Gospel, bad. And that therefore, the majority of men are damned, and only a few, in comparison, are going to be saved. The sermon today and next week will be then, God willing, a kind of meditative study on what is sometimes called the doctrine of the fewness of the saved. This doctrine is called so even though it is not infallibly declared by the church. But it has become known that it is the common opinion of the Greek and the Latin fathers and the learned historians of the church and the saints, two learned theologians and cardinals of the church, Cajetan and St. Robert Bellarmine, teach that the greater number of Christian adults are damned. And the great Jesuit theologian Suarez, after consulting all the theologians and making a diligent study of the matter, wrote this, quote, The most common sentiment which is held is that among Christians there are more damned souls than predestined souls, end quote. So although it is not an infallible dogma, it is as close to being a revealed truth, and it would be rash to ignore and dismiss this common teaching and replace it with your own opinions on the matter. As much as we would like to, as much as we would like to say, I don't agree with that. It's not true, Father. I am not giving you any of my own opinions on this. And you will see, God willing, next week, that I am included in this and probably even far worse than all of you lay people. Because it is the common opinion among them and even specifically St. John Chrysostom, who says that in his opinion, the majority of the priests are damned because they do not live according to their state of life. This is as fearful for me as it is for you. And so I am not going to give my own opinions on this because I'd probably excuse all of us, but I can't do that. I am very happy that I heard about this doctrine of the fewness of the saved. I wish that it were not true, but my wishes change nothing. We were taught in the seminary, unfortunately I disagreed then and obviously I disagree now, all the traditional seminarians and the priests know of this doctrine of the fewness of the saved. 
but we were told that it would disturb the people too much and so you should never preach it. As I say, I never heard it preached when I was growing up. And I went through Catholic masses all my life. Never heard it. I might have been sleeping that day. I might have missed mass that day too, just like some of you do. But I think that usually if something like this were preached, you'd hear about it. There'd be talk. And never did. And so I'm very grateful that I heard about this because I know it has shaken some of you up just as it has me. I don't intend for this to be striking terror in your hearts. You don't play with something like this. It is so frightful. I do not want you to fall into despair over this, but it is something that I think we better take very seriously. If the common opinion of the greatest of our saints and the Latin doctors and the Greek doctors and our historians and our theologians say not just that the majority of mankind is lost, but as we will see next week, the majority of Catholics are damned. Thank God somebody told us about this. As I say, it doesn't do any good for us with emotion to dismiss this thing. We may place this as a group of opinions since it is not infallibly declared. However, it is approved by the church because it is not condemned by the church teaching. Never has it been condemned. In fact, the majority of this sermon that you are going to hear next week is going to come, since I'm not going to give my own opinion, it is going to come from a sermon that was found in the works of St. Leonard of Port Maurice, a Franciscan, who lived in the 1700s and one of the greatest preachers of our church. And it was his sermon called The Fewness of the Saved, which I'm going to be using as the foundation to launch out into this terrible subject. So as I say, we cannot dismiss this thing on feeling and sentimentality as much as we want. Now what is the reason for studying such a topic? As with most of Christ's teachings and traditional apostolic doctrines today, this doctrine of salvation has been corrupted, or more precisely, liberalized, so that it no longer strikes fear into the people. So that most men now believe that they will be saved. And since Vatican II, the popes and bishops and priests and lay people accept that modernist opinion, rejecting with all their hearts the things that you will be hearing in these sermons. What they believe is universal salvation, heaven for everyone, with just a few exceptions, which would probably include us in their way of thinking. But how true the prophecy of Isaiah has come to be fulfilled. He said that there's going to come a time when darkness will be called light, and light will be called darkness, when good will be called evil, and evil will be called good. By taking this doctrine of salvation that has been handed down to us by our Lord through the apostles and through the centuries of the church, they have corrupted it. It now really means nothing anymore to anyone. Everyone goes to heaven. A little proof of this was seen in a survey conducted among 1,108 adult Americans in November 1990 by the Gallup poll. And it was reported in U.S. News & World Report in March 1991. And one of the questions in this religious survey to these American people on heaven and hell was this. What do you think your chances are of going to heaven? 78% said good to excellent, completely contradicting what the church has always believed. And even those who professed no religion but still believed in some kind of an afterlife, including hell, said that their chances were good to excellent too, 61% of them, and yet they have no religion. Only 4% believed that their chances of going to hell were good to excellent. And then sadly, more closer to home, those calling themselves Catholics today, the same opinion is found, especially among the conciliar Catholics an instance of this that maybe you have experienced already, I have, 
you express your sorrow for one of their recently deceased family members and you tell them that you will pray for them for their soul and the answer you are likely to get as I have gotten is oh there's no need he's already in heaven the whole idea among Catholics today about salvation has been distorted when after Vatican II the Requiem Mass was totally eliminated and all the black vestments were either sold or put in storage or burned as they were we found behind St. Louis Birch in the Dominican Church in Louisville in the alley in these big garbage cans one of the parishioners found them down there and then they replaced it with the almost heretical mass of resurrection now celebrated in white vestments I think that this blasphemy did much to distort Catholic thinking about salvation we no longer take it seriously anymore the mass of the resurrection of the new right the concili conciliar church in practice denies purgatory have you thought of that before in practice it denies the doctrine of purgatory which is a revealed doctrine we must believe in purgatory for salvation limbo is still a question but purgatory is not and when you have people who are going to these masses of resurrection in white vestments and there is nothing but joyousness you read father Shoup's book on purgatory explained by the lives and legends of the saints and you will find very well that there is nothing at all to rejoice about purgatory is a horrible state in fact it is said that the same fires in purgatory are the same in hell except that they do not last forever purgatory is not a happy place we call them poor souls not happy souls and yet this mass of the resurrection has now gotten Catholics in their practical thinking to even dismiss the idea of purgatory anymore and that has certainly infiltrated their thinking into the overall question of salvation such liberal thinking destroys the holy fear of God among the people because it allows the sinner to become even more lax in his ways he becomes more at ease with God's mercy and about how easy it is to convert at one's deathbed how many people say they're waiting for that moment I'll change when it gets time to die worse of all this false notion that the majority is saved plays into the hands of the devil who as Saint Eusebius says damns souls by reassuring them that all is well and yet Saint Paul again completely in line with the prophecy of Isaiah completely in line with all traditional Catholic teaching on this says just the opposite of the devil he says work out your salvation in fear and trembling right we know the phrase fear and trembling and our Blessed Mother in her Magnificat in st. Luke's Gospel says his mercy is unto generation unto generation on those who fear him even our Blessed Mother teaches us that we have to fear God and when we do we will receive mercy who fears God today I hope we do but how many do not they feel like they can get away with anything that God like father Wathan describes and who shall ascend as some kind of a doting grandfather who is reading the newspaper I'm at a corner and every once in a while he looks down on us and smiles and wonders how we're doing what a blasphemous thought to think that this is God who sent his only begotten son to die for us and all he does is just spend time up there doting around piddling and every once in a while being concerned with us and then one day just receive us smiling into his kingdom without having to even do anything for it pay your bills smile at your neighbor take the dog for a walk don't have a criminal record isn't this more or less what people think today is all necessary for salvation just be the perfect boy scout or girl scout type thing polite and courteous and honest what blasphemy the devil turns right around after these lessons from Our Lady and St. Paul and says no you're a nice person you shouldn't have to worry about being damned God wouldn't do that to you and we kind of like to hear that don't we we like people to say that to us the carry of ours didn't like it he was considered a saint even while he was living 
And people would come up to him and say, Oh, Father, you're just a saint. And he said, Don't say that to me. Because if I'm a saint, then you're going to think I might go straight to heaven when I die. And if I go to purgatory, you won't be praying for me. And I'm going to have to stay down there longer than I want to. It's not good for us to be thought of saints. We are supposed to be considered sinners. And we should think that. We should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And not with all of the sentimentality that has now invaded all of our thinking. So it is not for vain curiosity in any way whatsoever that we are going to study this topic. But this frightening doctrine will, we hope, wake up all of those who are sleeping comfortably in their sins right now, and maybe it will keep others from giving up their good struggle to overcome their inordinate passions, and then for everyone to begin to do more penance. Thus, to examine the great question, is the number of Catholics who are saved greater than the number of Catholics who are damned? It is of major importance to us. And it must be treated with care and delicacy so that it will be for you a source of grace and not a source of despair. Next week, we will begin by examining testimony from Holy Scripture. And we will end by proving that in spite of the terrible conclusion, the goodness of God is not in any way diminished and no blame can be placed on him at any time for a soul's damnation. If you are not here next week for some reason, I beg of you not to forego the opportunity of getting the tape. I understand that these are taped, not that I care for them, but some people want them to send to others and for those who are shut-ins. But if you are not here to hear the conclusion, and I don't even know if I'm going to end next week, who knows, but I do hope that you will keep up with this topic because I believe that this is something that is so terribly necessary for us today. If the saints and the doctors of the church thought so, then I hope that we will think so too. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. I always have to take a deep breath whenever you start attacking this subject that we began last week. Because it is so terrifying, it is something that you hope that no one will fall into despair because of. Those of you who were not here last week, I ask you not to be too shocked at the sermon this week. It is a continuation of last week's. I told you last time that you need to get the recorded tapes of this group of sermons because you need to hear the whole. It is not going to help you all to hear this thing in parts. It is not going to be healthy for you to hear one section of it and not the rest. It is an organic whole. It needs to be understood from beginning to end. And so I ask you that if you did not hear the beginning of this last week, do not become too terrified, do not fall into any despair, but wait until everything is over, and then you can do it. It is close to ten years for me being a priest, and I have never yet spoke on this subject. As I told you last week, we were told by Archbishop Lefebvre and our professors in the seminary that even though they believed in this doctrine that only few persons out of the majority of mankind are saved, although they believed it, they believed that it was best if we just left it alone, untouched. And in fairness to them, although there was no reason given except that it would disturb the people, out of fairness to them, I can understand that. It disturbs me. But I'm forced to believe it. I would imagine that the dear Archbishop said such a thing because his order was quite young. The priests were young. And it's one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, of all subjects in the Church to handle. That only few will be saved. And being young priests, they were not ready to tackle such a serious subject. 
well and keep the people from falling into the kind of despair that the Archbishop said they might. But I was trapped into this type of sermon because one of you here photocopied a sermon from St. Leonard of Port Maurice, which was the title, The Fewness of the Saved. And you read it, and I didn't know it was back there. And you came to me with a little bit of, well, maybe a little bit of terror, an awful lot of haste, and worry. Father, is this true? I've never heard of such a thing before. In all of my Catholic life, I've never heard of such a teaching. And here is a saint. So the word got out. And I said, well, I guess I have to do something about it. Although, you wish you didn't have to. When we speak of this doctrine after studying it, to try to present it to you in the correct way, the way the church understands it, we have to understand it this way. And when we talk about the fewness of the saved, according to St. Leonard of Port Maurice, what that is referring to is that the majority of adult Catholics will be damned. Not the majority of Christians, not the majority of human being individuals in the world, but of adult Catholics. As I say, when you approach this subject, you just take a deep breath and hope that maybe after you open your eyes and you get your breath back, that the whole thing will have just been a bad dream and it will go away, but it's not. And it doesn't do any good upon hearing that the fathers of the church and the doctors of the church and the saints and the spiritual writers and the commentators of Holy Scripture say that the majority of adult Catholics will be damned. It doesn't do any good to say, well then, let me run to another religion. It doesn't do any good either. It's the Catholic Church or it's no church. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is no salvation outside the church. If it's hard enough to get adult American liberalized Catholics to believe that there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church, how much more difficult is it going to get them to believe that inside the Catholic Church the majority of them are going to be damned too? Hence it is that if this is a doctrine that is taught by the majority of the fathers of the Church, and it is, if there is salvation outside the Catholic Church, I kind of like to think maybe it would have been better if we hadn't been born Catholics. If ignorance is going to save a person, wouldn't it have been easier to get saved? But we know that that's not true either. Ignorance, St. Thomas Aquinas says, is a punishment for sin. It's not a virtue. You don't get to heaven through ignorance. The Curie of Ars himself said that the greatest evils afflicting Catholics is ignorance of their religion. Venerable Anne Catherine Emmerich said that the church is only one, the Roman Catholic. And if it were left upon, if there were left upon earth one Catholic, he would be the one universal church. And Venerable Pope Pius IX said, neither sanctity nor salvation can be found outside the holy Catholic and apostolic Roman church. It is a sin to believe that there is salvation outside the Catholic church. And Pope Gregory XVI says, he who is separated from the Catholic Church will not have life. And Pope Pius XI, if any man does not enter the Church, or if any man departs from it, he is far from the hope of life and salvation. So you see, we have to stay where we are and do the best that we can, even though it is still a teaching that the majority of adult Catholics will be damned. There is no need for me to give my opinion on this. My opinion does no good to change the truth. It is sufficient for me to quote the fathers and doctors and saints of the church, and on their testimony I am personally forced to believe this, even though I may not want to. So whenever I speak about this subject, or think about it, I just go back to what those who have been canonized say about it. And then I don't have to rely on my emotions or my passions or my likes or dislikes. So I will continue today with last week's sermon 
titled according to St. Leonard of Port Maurice, The Number of Those Who Are Saved. And so the main body of these sermons are going to be taken as a sermon delivered by St. Leonard of Port Maurice. Here is some information about him so that you can have more confidence in what he is saying. St. Leonard was a Holy Franciscan friar. He lived in Rome and was one of the greatest missionaries in the history of the church. He used to preach to thousands in the open square. In every city and town where the churches could not hold all of his listeners. The Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament were his main crusades. But St. Leonard's most famous work was his devotion to the Stations of the Cross. In fact, he has the nickname the Saint of the Stations of the Cross. So brilliant and holy was his eloquence that once when he gave a two weeks mission in Rome, the Pope and the entire College of Cardinals came to hear him. St. Leonard is the one who gave us the divine praises that we pray at the end of benediction. Blessed be God, blessed be his holy name. These are the divine praises. He died in 1751 when he was 75 years of age. Here then, my dear people, are many of the holy man's thoughts on this topic the topic that few are saved. First, St. Leonard has us meditate on Holy Scripture to prove his point, and he goes to the Old Testament. He says, In the time of Noah, the entire human race was submerged by the great flood, and only eight people were saved in the ark. Then he quotes St. Peter, who says, The ark was a figure of the Catholic Church. And all of those outside of the ark, that is, out of the church, St. Peter says, were not saved. And St. Augustine adds, And these eight people who were saved signified that very few Christians are saved because there are very few who sincerely renounce the pleasures of the world. And those who renounce it only in words do not belong to the mystery represented by the ark. The Bible also tells us that only two Hebrews out of two million entered into the promised land after going out of Egypt, and that only four escaped the fire of Sodom and Gomorrah. And St. Leonard tells us, quote, all this means that the number of the damned who will be cast into the fire like straw is far greater than that of the saved, end quote. St. Leonard also remarks that he is speaking, and the saints are speaking, not only of the human race that will be damned, nor of Catholics taken without distinction, but only of adult Catholics who have free choice and thus capable of cooperating in the great matter of salvation. The Holy Franciscan says he would not finish if he pointed out all the examples by which Holy Scripture confirms this truth. And so he bypasses all of those other examples and he goes directly to the New Testament for final proof. And he asks this, What did our Lord answer the curious man in the Gospel who asked him, Lord, is it only a few who will be saved? And the Lord answered, Strive to enter by the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. And on another occasion, the Son of God says even more clearly, many are called, but few are chosen. He does not say that all are called and that out of all men few are chosen, but that many are called, which Pope St. Gregory the Great explains, quote, that out of all men many are called to the true faith, but out of them, few are saved. St. Leonard, at this point in his sermon, looks out at the audience and he notices that they don't seem to be getting his point. How he knew that, I don't know, but this is what he says. And so he makes it more concrete still by examining their various states of life. And remember, St. Leonard preached to the clergy as well as to the lay people. So whenever he preached, there were sure to be 
priests, bishops, probably cardinals that were present, certainly pastors of souls. And so St. Leonard asks, is there any state in the world more favorable to innocence in which salvation seems easier and of which people have a higher idea than that of priests, the lieutenants of God? At first glance, who would not think that most of them are not only good, but even perfect? Yet I am horror-struck when I hear St. Jerome, who died in the year 420, declaring that although the world is full of priests, barely one in 100 is living in a manner in conformity with his state. When I hear of a servant of God attesting that he has learned by revelation that the number of priests who fall into hell each day is so great that it seemed impossible to him that there be left any on earth. When I hear St. John Chrysostom explaining with tears in his eyes, I do not believe that many priests are saved. I believe the contrary, that the number of those who are damned is greater. And St. Vincent Ferrer, who died in 1444, many religious go straight to hell because they do not keep their vows. Notice one important fact in all of this. The dates that I gave you of these men's deaths, 420, 1444, and later on St. Bernard, 1153, they're speaking of Christians, but they're not speaking of Protestants because there was no Protestant in the world. Not until 1517. This is when Luther began his revolt. At that time in Europe, there were only Catholics. There was no such thing as a Protestant Christian. There was no such thing as Protestantism. When they say Christian, they mean Catholics. These are the days we think about as being the good old days. We're not talking about priests of the 20th century the ones who are scandalizing us so much by their actions and their their heresies. We're talking about a time when we all go back to thinking those were the great days of the church. This is when everybody was really Catholic. And yet we hear that the majority of the priests even then are damned. Is it any wonder the church is the way it is today? St. Leonard says, look higher still. And look at the prelates, the bishops and cardinals, and pastors of souls. If few out of those who are first in the church are saved, what will happen to you? Take all states of life. Take all sexes and every condition, husbands and wives and widows and young women and young men, soldiers and merchants, craftsmen, rich and poor, noble and plebeian, take them all. What are we to say about all these people who are living so badly? This is what St. Vincent Ferrer, 1444, says. He tells the incident of an archdeacon in Lyon, France, who gave up his position and retreated into a desert place to do penance for his sins. And that he died the same day and hour as the great St. Bernard, 1153 A.D., And this archdeacon, after his death, appeared to his bishop and said to him, Know, Your Excellency, that at the very hour I passed away, 33,000 people also died. Out of this number, Bernard and myself went up to heaven without delay, three went to purgatory, and all the rest were damned. An even more dreadful incident is told among the Franciscans. St. Leonard again says, One of our brothers in religion, well known for his doctrine and holiness, was preaching in Germany. He represented in his sermon the ugliness of the sin of impurity so forcefully that a woman fell dead in sorrow in front of everyone. Then coming back to life, she said, When I was presented before the tribunal of God, 60,000 people arrived at the same time from all parts of the world. Out of that number, three were saved by going to purgatory, and all the rest were damned. St. Anthony Mary Claret, who died in 1870, the only saint so far to have been canonized at the First Vatican Council, 
says this, A multitude of souls fall into the depths of hell, and it is of the faith that all who die in one mortal sin are condemned forever and ever. He says, according to statistics, approximately 80,000 people die every day. 80,000. How many of these will die in mortal sin? And how many will be condemned? For as their lives have been, so also will their end be. How frightful are these examples. In the first case, out of 30,000, only five were saved. And in the second, out of 60,000, only three. St. Louis Marita Monfort, the one that you know who wrote The True Devotion to Mary and The Secret of the Rosary, all many of these beautiful Marian devotional books that we have, here's what he says about the fewness of the saved. He says, The number of the elect is so small, so small, that were we to know how small it is, we would faint away with grief. One here, one there, scattered up and down the world. St. Augustine says, it is certain that few are saved. St. Thomas Aquinas, there are a select few who are saved. Lucy of Fatima, she says, taking into account the present development of humanity, only a limited number of the human race will be saved. Many will be lost. St. Alphonsus Maria de Liguori, the great doctor of the church, patron of moral theologians, he says, all persons desire to be saved, but the greater part, because they will not adopt the means of being saved, fall into sin and are lost. In fact, the elect are much fewer than the damned, for the reprobate are much more numerous than the elect. St. Benedict Joseph Labre, he says, meditate on the horrors of hell, which will last for eternity, because of one easily committed mortal sin. Try hard to be among the few who are chosen. Think of the eternal flames of hell and how few there are that are saved. And lastly, St. Teresa of Avila. She says, bad confessions damn the majority of Catholics. Bad confessions. My dear people, there is enough poison of liberalism and self-love in every single one of us that we don't want to believe that few adult Catholics are saved. We reason that we're not so bad. And certainly we're not wicked enough to deserve hell. Who here would think that of himself? But those of you who think this, of yourselves and of others, that is, that you're not wicked enough to go to hell, you're right in that part. You may not be wicked enough, but that's not the criteria. You're not thinking like Catholics. You're thinking like Protestants. Father Watham, in Who Shall Ascend on page 4, corrects your bad thinking in this subject in one of the most powerful statements I think that I've found in his book. He says, The following is a principle of the first magnitude, that is, of the greatest importance for our Catholic thinking. And it's this, men do not go to heaven because they are bad enough to deserve hell. They go to hell because they are not good enough to deserve heaven. No, we are not so wicked. None of us here, in the way that the world describes wickedness. You do not have to be so wicked to go to hell, but there's no other place to go to if you have one mortal sin on your soul. We're just not good enough to go to heaven. That's the way we're supposed to be thinking. When the world talks about wickedness, whenever we think of hell, we have this liberalism in us that makes us believe that only the worst kind of people, the most depraved mass murderers are this such, are the ones who go to hell. But our Lord didn't say that. He says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And who he, be he who believes not shall be condemned. All you have to do is not believe. There is nothing mentioned of murder or of adultery or fornication 
or of theft or of laziness or of missing your Sunday Mass obligation. Nothing of those types of things. And yet they too, if done, will make you unworthy of going to heaven. There is no middle place for us to go. A lot of people are not wicked enough in the world's eyes that they deserve hell. They say, I haven't done that much. It really is so bad. But it doesn't matter. We like to compare ourselves to other people, and that's wrong. God does not compare us to other people. We were not born in groups, and we're not going to be judged in groups. We're going to be judged for all of the graces that we have been given, all of the lights that we've been illuminated with, and how we accepted them and cooperated with them. This is how we're going to be judged. On page 5 in Who Shall Ascend, Father gives the basic requirements that every human being has to fulfill in order to get saved. But there's more than that. There's the second part. How worthy am I supposed to become after that? To whom much is given, much is expected. And I suppose that to whom little is given, little is expected. And all the degrees in between. I know it's in black and white for every single one of us. What is the basic necessity for salvation? But then there's the other part that I don't know about you. I know about myself. But this is where we have to pray. We have to look at our Lord in the tabernacle. We have to talk to Our Lady in our rosary and in our meditations and say, what more do I need to do? What is expected of me to make me worthy of gaining heaven? We've all got our different limitations according to the gifts that have been given to us. For every man there is a universal requirement. Father talks about those, and then above and beyond that, it's each individual for himself. In that, we don't judge each one. We can judge each other according to what's objective, according to what Christ required us and what the church requires. But that's not all. And this is why it's so hard to get through to a lot of you Catholics that you can't get saved just by coming to Mass and fulfilling your duty maybe confessing every once in a while, doing a good deed here and there, doing some fasting, going along with the laws of the church, God expects more of you. How much more, I don't know. That's between you and Him. And this is where we say, we may not be good enough to enter into heaven. If you would, please remember that principle. A person does not go to hell because he is so wicked. He just can't get into heaven because he's not good enough. And what does that mean for us? Well, in the black and white, even one mortal sin of thought or of omission is sufficient to keep in the eyes of the world a person who is considered a saint. We're not good enough. Now that we can overcome through prayer. We have to do it that way. God gives us the lights in our prayers. But we don't pray enough, I don't think. And some of you also. Where in the world are you on Sundays? Many of you I don't even see anymore. You come so rarely. What are you doing in your life? Is it that difficult for you to get to Mass? If you have excuses, that's one thing. And that's between you and God. But I warn you, I think that you're taking your mass obligations too casually. You're not even fulfilling the objective. Not to mention the subjective. Where is the spirit of the law? The letter you're not even fulfilling. And you're going to be held accountable for that. So we are supposed to say to ourselves, well, I may not be wicked, but still, am I good enough to get to heaven? That I don't know. And if I'm not, then the only alternative for me is to hell. Because as St. Francis of Assisi said, between heaven and hell stands the Christian. And he has to fall into one or the other. If you think this way, my dear people, then this is Catholic thinking. It's healthy thinking. It'll keep you from becoming liberal. And it goes along perfectly with what St. Peter says in his first epistle, chapter 4. If the just man shall scarcely be saved... Where shall the ungodly man 
and the sinner appear. If the just man shall scarcely be saved. That's what we think we are. We would like to hope that we are just. Let me continue with all of this topic next week. But in the meantime, you've got to pray. And you've got to pray well. Not just make noise in your prayers and say, okay, I did these five or six prayers. Mean what you say. It is not important how many prayers you say, but how well you say even the few that you do. That's what counts. Fervor and devotion and attention in your prayers. God doesn't require that we pray a lot. In fact, it even says in the Holy Scripture, let your speech be yes, yes, and no, no. God doesn't require many words. You don't need many words. In fact, sometimes you don't need words at all to say, I love you. But we've got to pray. And if we pray, we'll be assured of our salvation. Because St. Teresa tells us, all who are in hell are there because they did not pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.